Well, now what we're going to do is take a look at the Sabbath, but let's open with prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for your Shabbat. Uh, what a gift you have given to us. So, Father, I pray that you would just open our ears as we look into that wonderful gift that you have given to us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, uh, there's a book that we don't have, but you can get it online, uh, where I, I've had this book forever, and it's an incredible book, and it's called The Sabbath. But it's by a man, uh, and I recommend every book he's ever written, but his name is Abraham Joshua Heschel. And uh, so this information I'm getting from is from several sources, but mostly from him. So I want to give credit where credit is due. If we'll put the first clip up, we'll get started. It, let's take a look at the Sabbath. Let's start with Isaiah chapter 58, verse 10. It says, if you extend your soul to the hungry and you satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness will be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. He'll strengthen your bones. You'll be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Now, that's pretty incredible so far. Then it says, those from among you shall build the old waste places. You're going to raise up the foundations of many generations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, and I have the word turn there, it's shuv, the sheen, the vav, and the vet. Shuv, it means, uh, sometimes we hear the word repent, okay? It's also return, and, or to turn around. And this is the word for repent or return, and it is shuv. Your foot from the Sabbath, and I have the word Shabbat there. You can see the sheen, uh, the bait, and the tab. I don't put the dogishes in. <clears throat> it says, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. Now notice, God doesn't say on the Jewish holy day. He doesn't say on Israel's holy day. He says on my holy day. And then he says, if you call the Sabbath a what? If you call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and you honor him, not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. How many of you want to delight yourself in the Lord? Okay. He says the way you delight in the Lord is by calling the Sabbath a delight. If you call the Sabbath legalism, guess what? If you call the, the Sabbath some horrible, tortuous event, you're not going to delight in the Lord. He says if you want to delight in the Lord, then call the Sabbath a delight. I mean, that's pretty plain. And then he says, then you will delight in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Wow. I mean, to me, that's a good reason to call the Sabbath the delight if you want to ride on the high places with the Lord. And so what do we see here? We see it is called what? My Sabbath. Let's look at this Isaiah 56, 4 through 7. For thus saith the Lord to the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even to them will I give in my house and within my walls, a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Now, this is important. It says also the sons of the stranger. This is the non-Jewish person that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Every single person, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. Do you see what God is saying? Me, my, myself, and my. This is mine. Okay, this is not about you. Okay, and it's not necessarily about the Jewish people or Israel. He's saying here, this is, these are my Sabbaths. It's my house. It's my offerings. It's my mountain. It all belongs to me. Let's look at this next clip here. 
We're going to look at Genesis. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 2, verse 1 and 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. So here we have, it was on the seventh day. And then what does it say God did? God did two things. He blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all of his work, which God created and made. Now here's what's important to catch. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. It says, For he that, had, that has entered into his rest, or God's rest, for he that has entered into God's rest, has also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Okay, so God ceased from his own works on the Sabbath, and then he asked us to cease from our works on the Sabbath. So the Shabbat is critically important to our picture, telling us the good news is we don't work to earn our salvation. It's a free gift. That's what it is all about. The Sabbath is the gospel message. When we don't keep the Sabbath, we are denying the good news. Paradise was a free gift. It was not earned. Think about it. Let's look at this picture. Okay, we're going to look at creation. Here he created the world, right? And then we zero in on here on Israel. Now we're going to look at the Garden of Eden. I believe the Garden of Eden or paradise was in Israel. But look at Genesis 2, 8. It says, the Lord God, he's the one who planted the garden, eastward in Eden. And then he put the man whom he had formed. And we see in Genesis 2, 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To dress it and to keep it. And the word there in the Hebrew means to work. And the word for keep is shamar, which means to hedge it about with thorns, to guard it, to protect it. And so what do we see here? Work or labor was a blessing and it was not part of the curse. Think about it. Adam was told to work the garden before the curse came. What was part of the curse was toil. We see that in Genesis 5, 29. Let's jump ahead to, to Noah. His dad called him Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil. And you see the, the word here, it's a bone. Of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now, the Sabbath was created before the curse. It was to be a time of shalom and building relationships with each other and the Creator. That's what it was for. Now, let's go look at Genesis 3.17. It says, And then Adam, he said, Because you've hearkened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Do you realize the word for sorrow here is the same word for toil in Genesis 5 in the Hebrew? So the same word in the Hebrew is translated sorrow in one place and toil in the other place. So we see because of the curse, and here's the other thing that I just caught this morning. I was looking at this. If I told you I was going to do something for your sake, you think I'm doing it for your benefit, right? I'm going to do this for you. God said to uh, Adam, I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. Gee, God, <laughs> can you not do it if you really have me in mind, not curse the ground? Now i got to toil and sweat. But when you think about it, I mean, that's just something to contemplate on. God said, I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. I mean, but think, look what happens when someone has too much time on their hands. That's when they really get into trouble. In Genesis 3.19, he says, In the sweat of your face, you're going to eat bread till you return back to the ground. Now let me ask you something. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Okay, at creation, he rested, right? Before the curse, God told Adam, okay, I want you to work. Now, do you think God had Adam keep the Sabbath? Of course he did. Of course he did. Work and Sabbath both came before the curse. Both of them were for the curse. And Adam, in other words, it's for all of mankind. A lot of the Jews like to say the Sabbath is just for the Jews. It's not for the rest of mankind. But no, when you look at the Sabbath and work, both came long before the curse, okay? That's, that's the reason why. All of us are in Adam. Now, here's where we're going to get it's kind of interesting. 
when you think of creation, you have to have three things. You have to have time, space, and matter. Is that right? I think not all of us are necessarily scientists, but I think everyone agree you need time, space, and matter for creation. All right? Now, <clears throat> what was declared holy first? Was time first? Was space first or was matter? Which one was declared holy first? Time was, the Sabbath. Okay? It says, and God blessed the seventh day, and he what? In other words, time was the first thing that was declared holy. And then, space or matter? Well, we see matter, objects, us. A people was declared holy next. We see that in Exodus 31, 13. It says, speak to the children of Israel and say, verily, my Sabbath you will keep, for it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does what? Sanctify you. So first God sanctifies time. Then he sanctifies a people group. And then he sanctifies a place. But I want you to notice the first thing he did right after he sanctified the people group in Exodus 19, 6, we also see that. He says, you will be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And these are the words which will speak to the children of Israel. So here he, he, he sanctifies time, then he sanctifies people. And the first thing he does is reminds them that they were holy and they were to keep holy time. In Exodus 28, he says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So he sanctifies time, then he sanctifies the people and says, by the way, you need to keep this time holy. That's what's going to make you a holy people. And then we also see in Matthew 12, 8, it says, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Okay, so if he's the Lord of the Sabbath, he's trying to say, I'm not going to change it. And then comes a holy place or holy space. We see that in Exodus 25, verse 8. God said, okay, I want these holy people that are keeping my holy times to build me a holy place, a sanctuary. Make me a sanctuary that I can dwell among them. But now, you know what's interesting? Now, this is not in your notes. I just add, I added this later on as I was going through this again. See, God coming to man, you have the holy of holies, the holy place, and then the burnt altar. But man had to go to the burnt altar, you know, to the labor, holy place, holy of holies. So, and man always seems to do things backwards. They don't want to do the way God wants. They want to come they want. Well, what happens? Do you remember the story after Solomon died? You have Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Here, God sanctified time first, and then man, and then a place. And here you have Jeroboam doing just the opposite. He creates a God, and he sanctifies a place first, then a people, and then a time. Working the exact opposite like God does. You see in 1 Kings 12, 27 through 33, he makes two calves of gold. He puts one in Bethel, he puts the other in Dan. And then I have in bold on your notes and underlined. So what does he do after he does that? He makes a house of high places, and then he makes priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And then Jeroboam ordained a time, a feast of the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month. So he's doing it just the opposite direction of what God does. But let's take a look at Leviticus 23. It's where we read the first and the last day of Chag HaMatzot. Anyone know what that is? No, not hog, chag. Chag is feast. Ha is the matzot is unleavened bread. So on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we see the first and last day is a Shabbat. So I have on the picture up here, I kind of have uh, the different feasts. And in Leviticus 23, 6 through 8, it says on the feast, uh, I mean on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And then it says this, the first day you'll have a holy convocation. You'll do no servile work, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is also to be a holy convocation where you do no work. So here you have the Shabbat, and then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the first day and the seventh day is a Shabbat. So in other words, you could have a Shabbat on the normal seventh day, but bookends not on the Saturday. You could have another Shabbat at the beginning and the end. And then we see Shabbat or Pentecost, which is what I have here. You'll notice in Leviticus 23, 16, it says, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. 
Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. And Leviticus 23, 1 says, you will proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation. Do no customary work. It'll be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So we see the Feast of Pentecost is also a Shabbat. Then we see the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. Uh, that is also a Shabbat. We see in Leviticus 23, 4, speak to the children of Israel and say in the seventh month. You notice all the sevens here? In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you'll have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of shofars, a holy convocation. Then we come to the feast of Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is like the Sabbath of Sabbaths. We see in Leviticus 23, 27, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there will be a day of atonement. It'll be a holy convocation to you, and you'll afflict your souls, offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And then in verse 32, it says, It will be unto you a Sabbath of rest. Afflict your souls the ninth day of the month at even, even to even, so you celebrate your Sabbath. Then we also see the, the last feast, uh, Sukkot. Then it says uh, on Leviticus 23, 39, the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit, you're to keep a feast to the Lord seven days. The first day, now watch this, here's a little hitch. It says the first day is to be a Sabbath, and what else? The well, no, wait a minute. If it's seven days long, where do you get the eighth day from? Okay, well, that's called Shemini Atzeret. And, but anyway, it's the first and the last day of Sukkot, or also Sabbaths. Okay, what do these all reveal to us? These all reveal and indicate that every aspect of our salvation is a complete work of God. We can rest in His finished work. And that's what's important. So when people say, if you keep the Shabbat, you're being legalistic, it's just the opposite. I'm keeping Shabbat because I'm not legalistic. Keeping the Shabbat says I can rest in what God does. I don't have to rest in my own works. So keeping Shabbat isn't works. Keeping Shabbat is, is testifying I don't believe I'm saved by works. That's why I'm keeping Shabbat, because I'm trusting in His works. It's amazing how that can get turned around. We see God has holy times. Now, here's something that is happening tonight. I don't know if you know, but tonight is Rosh Chodesh. Tonight is the first day of Nisan. Now, the new moon is not considered a Sabbath, but it is considered holy times. Uh, we see in 1 Samuel 20, 18, here Jonathan is talking to David. He hadn't yet become king, but he says, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you'll be missed because your seat will be empty. On the new moon, they would have a festive dinner. They would blow the shofar. Uh, and David, if he didn't show up, he would definitely be missed. We see in Psalm 81.3, blow the shofar in the new moon, in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 66.22, here we see when the new heaven and the new earth comes, God says, which I will make, are going to remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it'll come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh uh, come to worship before me, says the Lord. So, again, if the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we see after the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to be keeping the Sabbath, then I think it's a good idea to keep them now. Now, let's go back to this concept of time, space, and matter, or time, space, and physicality. Do you realize most of our labor is in pursuit of things? It really is. What do we do? We spend our time... Filling our space with things. Okay? Time, space, and matter was all part of creation. And we spend our time filling our space with things. Then, much labor is spent in getting an even bigger space to store more things. Now, here's what's interesting. Even religions are dominated by the notions that their deity resides in some kind of space, like mountains or rivers, stones, or in some geographic place. The deities of other peoples were associated with places or things. Many see God as present in the universe. I believe all of us believe God is present in the universe, right? But that is taken to mean his presence in physical space and in nature rather than his presence being in time and history as if he were a thing rather than a spirit. Did you catch that? This is, this is what we do. We see God as someone, but God is a spirit. 
He's not a thing. He's not matter. I mean, this is what we're used to. So we see him as residing in some space. Here's another verse that wasn't on your notes. You can add in there, which talks about this. This is 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. Many of you are familiar with this story where after the Assyrian captivity had taken all the Jews away, the people that were planted in Israel spoke to the king saying, hey, the nations which you've removed and placed in the cities of Samaria don't know the manner of the God of this particular land. Therefore, he sent lions among them and behold, they've killed them because they don't know the manner of the God of the land. So here you see, they would think that the God of a specific land was a different God from another land. Get a load of this. The Bible is more concerned with time than space. It pays more attention to events and generations. Realize the God of Israel was the God of events. He is the redeemer from slavery. He's the revealer of the Torah. He manifests himself in the events of history rather than in things or places. Judaism is a religion of time aiming at the sanctification of time. This is what the Bible is trying to have us do because that's what God started with. The first thing he did was sanctify time. No one on their deathbed says they wish they had spent more time at the office. Do they? What, is, what is the most important thing to a person on their deathbed is what? Time. They wish they had spent their time differently. Time with our spouses, our families, our friends. That's what we want to remember. Now here's the thing. To the space-minded man, all days are alike. Every day, you hear that all the time. Every day is the same. All days are alike. There is no Sabbath. There's nothing set apart. Every, every day is holy. Well, if every day is holy, then nothing is holy. Because that means common. Okay? But what we need to realize is the Sabbath or the seventh day is something different. We need to be attached to holiness in time. That's what we need to do. The Sabbath is the goal. It's, think about it. God created the heavens and the earth, and the last thing was what? The Sabbath. So that means the Sabbath is our goal line. So every week we start our work and we're looking forward to the Sabbath because that's the goal. Just like in creation, the Sabbath was the goal. It was the end of the creation of heaven and earth. Romans 10, 4 is a very misinterpreted verse. This is where it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. But if you go and look it up in the Greek, the actual translation should be, for Messiah is the goal of the Torah. The word end there implies like an end zone. Not the end done away with, but an end zone. So Messiah is the goal of the Torah for righteousness to everyone that believes. How many of you know Messiah is the goal of the Torah? That's what it says. We also see that Messiah is the Lord of the Sabbath, right? So the Sabbath is the goal line of creation. Now let me demonstrate it to you this way. I have a football field here. All right, here we got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday... Shabbat! Okay? And so you get the football, and he kicks the ball. Woohoo! And what do you see? You see Shabbat. Woohoo! Okay. That is the goal line. That's what we're headed to. Now, here's the thing we know what to do with space, don't we? Fill it. But we don't know what to do with time. Time to us is this dreaded monster staring us in the face. Here's time. <laughs> time is this giant incinerator taking every moment of our lives. So what do we do? We retreat for the shelter into things of space. Okay? To the space-minded man, the material becomes our great cathedrals. Look what we can build. This is man's great cathedrals. What man? I'm going to think of a Tower of Babel. These are things that we can build. But in the Bible, the Sabbaths are our great cathedral. It's not what we can build. It's what God built. It's not our Towers of Babel. It's what he created. Here's the other thing. All of the Sabbaths 
are time dependent. They, there were set sacrifices, the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, specific times. All the prayers were time dependent. All the main themes of faith are time dependent. What are we to do? We're to remember times. We're to remember the creation. We're to remember the exodus. We're to remember the times that's coming of the resurrection of the dead. So the higher goal of spirituality is not to amass the accumulation of stuff, but to face sacred moments. Think about it this way. Is a, a wedding ring a thing? It's matter, right? Okay. So here, if there's a lost and found box, and someone happens to, all of a sudden they look and they find your ring, and out comes this ring and they give you this ring. Okay, you're going to be glad that they found your ring, right? But what moment are you going to remember? You're going to remember the moment. We must not forget that it is not the thing that lends significance to the moment. It is the moment that lends significance to the things. Time is what is important. It's the moment. It's, that's what we remember, isn't it? When you go back, oh, I remember this particular moment. That's what made it so significant, not the thing. You get the things to help you remember the moment. As a matter of fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, what does it say? To everything there's a season and a time. To every purpose under the heaven. There's a time to be born, there's a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, etc., etc. The problem is we're often plucking at planting time and planting at plucking time. Because we don't know what time it is. We think all time is alike, so it doesn't matter when I plant or when I pluck. But God says, no, you need to know the significance of the times. All of us can understand and see the diversity of nature, I believe. Okay? Can you see how the Grand Canyon is more awe-inspiring than a trench? Can you see that? Okay, how about, do you think an eagle is more awe-inspiring than a worm? We can see the diversity in nature, but we don't have a similar discretion for the diversity of time. Do we know what time is? Do we know how one time is more important than another time, or is everything the same? This is our problem. We, we can see the distinction in nature, in matter, but we don't see it in time. First Chronicles 12, 32, it says the children of Issachar, they were men that had understanding of the times. They knew what Israel ought to do. The Antichrist, in Daniel 7, 25, he's going to speak great words against the Most High. He's going to wear out the saints of the Most High, and he's going to try to change the times and the laws because he knows that that's what is important. But here's what's amazing about all the different Sabbaths of all the feast days that I told you about. Do you know that the seventh day, the first Sabbath, is distinct from all the other Sabbaths? Why is that? The feasts are all nature-based as far as they are agricultural-based, and they use the sun or the moon. So all these other feasts are dependent upon the sun, the moon, but the seventh day is not. The Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, is not dependent on anything based in nature. It's totally detached from the world of space. It's completely holiness in time. If you remember, even at the creation, the first three days, there was no sooner sun or moon, yet they were still called days. So on the seventh day, we are called to turn from the world of creation to the time of the creation of the world and to its creator. Now, to some people, the Sabbath is just a day of rest to renew our strength so we can get back to work. It's more than that. The Sabbath is not just to rest and renew our strength for more activity as much as it is just to be for the sake of life itself. Man is not to be considered just a beast of burden. 
The love of the Sabbath is the love of mankind for what they and God have in common. Isn't that cool? The Sabbath is the most precious present mankind has received from God's treasure house. It is time set aside with the Creator Himself. It's not a day to mortify yourself, but to celebrate the creation of the world with the Creator. In observing the Sabbath, it is more than just regulations or techniques in fulfilling some commandment. It's recognizing the presence of God in this world. That's what it's all about. God wants to spend time with you. I mean, how many of us sometimes we, we get so busy, we get so caught up trying to fill our space with things, we don't even see our kids grow up and they're gone and we wish we had spent more time with our kids or we wish we had, our parents had spent more time with us. Matthew 12, 11 and 12, it says, He said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, won't lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. They were getting caught up in the minutia of things rather than valuing people. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, it says, He said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So what is that telling us? Our life is not to be preoccupied in filling space with buildings, bridges, and things, but in the converting of time into eternity. That's what we're supposed to be doing. As a matter of fact, and, uh, how many of you were here or were not here? Who was not here on Saturday on this last Sabbath? Okay, some of you weren't. I'm going to show a little PowerPoint that I did this last time, this last Shabbat. Uh, in Exodus 35.3, it says you're not to kindle a fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Right? Well, we're going to do a little midrash here. In James, let's look at this next clip, chapter 3, uh, verse 5 and 6, it says, uh, Hey, the tongue is a little member. It boasts its great things. Behold how great a matter, a little fire it kindles. So I've got some little fires that this tongue is kindling. The tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fires of hell. So what do we see here? We're not supposed to kindle fire on the Sabbath. So what is that telling us? On the Sabbath, when we come together, it is not the time to attack each other verbally. It is not the time to catch up on the latest gossip. It's the time to focus our conversation on the Creator and on His Word and talk about how wonderful He is. So let's take another look at the Sabbath. In John 17, verse 3, it says, This is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is now, it's not just in the future. So let's not waste our lives in the pursuit of temporary life, but with the pursuit of eternal life. And we can start now. Now look at Exodus 31, verse 13 and 14. It says, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep. It's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Okay, so first thing, by keeping the Sabbath, we decide that God is the one who sanctifies us, and He tells us how He sanctifies us. And that's where the covenant is at. Now think about this. If the Sabbath was made for man, and it's supposed to be holy unto you, then without man there is no Sabbath. There's no need for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is in need of you. And since Sabbath was made for man, then that means there is something special that will impart to you that no other day will impart. Think about that. Here's man, okay? And God says, keep the Sabbath because I want to impart something to you. So God is imparting something into your life. But here's the thing. This is keeping the Sabbath as since, uh, God created just like he created the spoon for cereal, okay? <laughs> or we created a spoon for cereal, or whatever, okay? God created a Sabbath for you, which means we have a need of it. God wouldn't have created it for us if we didn't need it. 
And he gives it to us as a gift that we don't have to earn. And it is just like gravity. What the law of gravity is to physical nature, the law of the Sabbath is to the life of your spiritual nature. These are just laws. Whether you like, do you like, whether you like the law of gravity or not, does it still work? If you don't follow the law of gravity, what happens? Okay, well, it's the same thing with keeping the Sabbath. Here, I've got a little picture. We us put a little airplane in there. Okay, scoot along. Okay, there's a law of aerodynamics. Okay, but if someone decides to jump out of that plane, there's another law of gravity that hurts them, doesn't it? Okay, can you go against the law of gravity? You may try, but the consequences aren't good. Well, the same thing with the Sabbath. We need to understand the Sabbath is a law, not whether you like the, the laws or not, it's not that kind of a law. And when the, it's just, it's a principle of nature, of what God created. And if you keep it, you're going to ride on the high places of the earth with God. And if you don't, you're going to crash. Spiritually. In Isaiah 51, verse 6, it says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. What's going to happen? It says the heavens are going to vanish away like smoke. The earth is going to wax old like a garment. It's just going to begin to disappear. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So what do we see here? What is going to disappear? It's the spatial things. It's the matter. It's the spatial things that are constantly running out. Time never expires. Just like the landscape, time appears to be in constant motion. But it is the world of space that is rolling through the infinite expanse of time. It is the world of space that is perishing. Did you catch that? I'm going to put it to you another way. Time can be sensed from the point of view of space or spirit. Have you ever had a sense that the landscape is moving when it was you who was standing still instead of the obvious opposite? Like you're at a gas station and all of a sudden the car next to you you think is rolling? but it's you that's rolling and not the car. You know what I'm talking about? Here's a train going down the road, okay? And you're the one that's moving, but the landscape's not moving. Sometimes we think time is moving, but time in one sense is eternal, and we're the ones that are moving through it. You following me now? Just like we think that landscape is moving. No, the landscape ain't going nowhere. You're the one that's moving. Sometimes we think time is this big monster that's just eating up all of our days, but no, we're the ones that are moving through it, and we're the earth and the sun and the moon, and everything's going to vanish away. We're the ones that are moving, not time. Time is eternal. Kind of interesting thought. Each one of us can own and do occupy space, yet no one possesses time. All we can do with time is share it. We pass through time, but we occupy space. We can change and shape the things within our space, but time is beyond our grasp or power. It belongs exclusively to God. Time is beyond and independent of space. It is everlasting. Exodus 12, 14, God says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you will keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Again, here we have a time in history. He says, I want you to remember this time. Look at Deuteronomy 29, 10, 15. It says, you stand this day, all of you before the Lord your God, your captains, your tribes, elders, officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, wives, strangers that are in your camp, from the hewer of wood to the draw of water that you should enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and to his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you when? This day. That he may establish you today for a people to himself, that he may be unto you a God, as he has said unto you and as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then look what he says. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that stands here with us this day before the Lord our God and also with him that is not here with us this day. 
We can enter into this covenant this day. Hebrews 3.15, while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. It's all about today. And what we need to do is take advantage of the time that we have because there's going to come a time when we won't have that time anymore. So that, in one sense, I, I want to just kind of give you a whole concept of keeping the Sabbath from another point of view, other than just, you know, that's what the Bible says. It is what the Bible says. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next 10 minutes, what the Bible says. But I just wanted to give you the concept of why keeping the Shabbat, because it's, it's, it's holy time. And that's the first thing God created, because he wanted to have time with you, because he knows that's what's important. Now, how many of you... I have heard, I've heard this before. People say, well, in the Brit Hadashah or in the New Testament, nowhere does it command you to keep the Sabbath. All the other commandments are mentioned, but not the Sabbath. How many of you heard that before? Oh, this, that's going to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and I'll show you why. Look, let's just look at what it says. I mean, there are some things that are just called the obvious. Mark 1.21, they went into Capernaum and straightway on the... Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. This is talking about Yeshua. And the, the Greek word here is sabbaton. I have the, the Greek there. And it, it, it means the day of weekly repose, the Sabbath. Look at Luke 4, 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Luke 4, 31. He then goes down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them when? On the Sabbath days. Luke 13, 10. And he was teaching at one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. So uh, does it have to say keep the Sabbath or the very fact that that's what they're doing all throughout here kind of tells you that's what we're doing? Luke 23, 56. They returned and prepared spices and ointments and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandments. So not only did Yeshua keep the Sabbath, his followers kept the Sabbath. Now let's jump over to Acts 13, 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might preach to them when? The next Sabbath. The Gentiles met in the synagogues all the time back then. Acts 13, 44. And then the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Acts 15, 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day so the Gentiles can come and learn on the Sabbath. <clears throat> this is after Jesus rose, yes. And what do we see in Acts 17, 2? What about Apostle Paul? Okay, what does it say? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Let's look at Acts 18, 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So here again, you see the Greeks and the Gentiles were in the synagogues on the Sabbath. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days. What is he saying here? He's speaking to the Gentiles who are keeping the Sabbath and the new moons and the holy days, and he's saying, don't let anyone judge you for doing it. And yet that's been turned completely around, saying, well, see, let, no one's supposed to judge you if you don't. No, it's saying, don't let no one judge you because you are. Things just get totally turned around. But what's really frustrating is uh, mistranslations. Do you remember when I told you how sometimes purposely things get mistranslated, like synagogue and ecclesia they'll pick and choose there was some other picking and choosing i found get a load of this in mark 9 5 it says peter answered and said to jesus master it's good for us to be here let us make three tabernacles one for you one for moses and one for elias or elijah remember that story the greek word here for one is mia okay Every time, if you look up the word Mia in your strong concordance, you're going to see one, 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 one. All right, let's go to Acts 7, 12. Here it says, when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out, he sent out our fathers first. 
Here the word in the Greek for first is proton. And if you look up the word proton in your concordance, you're going to see proton is translated first, 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 first. Matter of fact, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, proton, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So I'm going to put up this uh, PowerPoint. Here we see Sabbath is Sabaton. One is Mia, first is proton. Everyone got that? Okay, got that cemented down in your mind. Okay, now I'm going to show you something else. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verse 1, what, what are some of the things the Jews do on the Sabbath day? It says, it came to pass, uh, this is referring to Yeshua, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day. So what do they do on the Sabbath day? Bread. They eat bread on the Sabbath day, and they were watching him. Well, let's go to, I believe, a very horribly translated verse now, which is totally misunderstood. Now, first off, do you think, did they meet on the Sabbath? Did Yeshua meet on the Sabbath? Yes. Did his disciples keep the Sabbath? In the New Testament, did they all keep the Sabbath? Okay, so does he have to say keep the Sabbath? I mean, this is what they're doing. You lead by example anyway, right? Look at this. We just saw they eat bread on the Sabbath day, right? Acts 20, verse 7, in almost all your Bibles, it says, On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, and everyone says, We'll see that Sunday they met on Sunday. But if you look at this verse, the word is Mia and sabbaton so it should be translated translated as and one sabbath when the disciples came together to break bread paul preached to them ready to depart on the morrow and continue to speech until midnight it doesn't say proton it says mia but they decided to change the first day of the week when it should have been translated one sabbath now here's another one look at it, Acts 20, verse uh, 7. I mean, obviously they come to break bread on the Sabbath. That's what it says. But now let's look at 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection that for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. And that's what they say. We'll see you again. But no, it's Mia. It should say, now concerning the collection, collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. On one Sabbath, let every one of you lay by him in stores. God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. It's not Proton. It's Mia. And so here you can see that it's so obvious when you read everything, it's on the Sabbath, but now they want to change it from Mia to Proton to give a different meaning, as if in Acts all of a sudden they changed the way they did things. In Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. So Jeremiah was all about return. And remember what the Hebrew word for return was? Shuv. Remember that? I'm going to put up the word shuv. Here's the word shuv. And you see the sheen bet right there. Okay, here, and there's the vav. I have it kind of colored in because I want to show you guys something. When you think of the word shuv, I want you to think of repent or return. And with that, let's look at Jeremiah 6, 16 through 19. Here it says, again, God wants them to return. It says, thus saith the Lord, stand you in the ways and see and ask for what? The old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein and you shall find what? Rest for your souls. But they said, I don't want to walk that way. So God says, also, I'm going to set a watchman over you saying, please listen to the sound of the shofar. But they said, I don't want to listen. Therefore, he says, okay, fine. Hear you nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I'm going to bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. And why? Because they've not listened to my words, nor to my Torah, but they've rejected my Torah. They haven't returned to the covenant. Well, you know what's amazing about this word to return? You take the sheen and the bed and you add a tab, you get Shabbat. That's what we're supposed to return to. The Shabbat. And the tab in the ancient picture language was a cross. The Shabbat is returning to the covenant. 
That's what it is. And then you'll find rest for your souls. And you're right on the high places. But if you say, I don't want to listen. I don't want to do it. Well, fine, you don't have to. But like gravity, these are laws of creation. So that's just my little teaching on Shabbat. And what I, what I want to end with is something that we've just added to our website. I'm going to put this last picture up. I've always had a heart for kids. And we've had people saying, we're homeschoolers. How do we help our kids? What are some things we can do to help our kids? On our website, at the top of the homepage, we now have signed up with uh, Bible Islands. And this is great for homeschoolers, for grandkids. These are tools for training. It is all about the Bible. It's totally safe. But it also teaches math skills, English skills. Uh, uh, Zach, Tom's uh, grandson, was at the office, and he was doing the free pass, and him and I were trying together to figure out this math thing. I couldn't even figure it out. I mean, it is very good. So if, if there's you know, any kids, we're supposed to train them up in the way of the Lord, right? When you sit down, when you rise up. There's all so much garbage out there on television. There's so much garbage in the computer games. This is something... This is with Compedia, who's based in Israel, and they can learn Hebrew on this. There's all kinds of things for your kids. So I really encourage people, if they want to invest in their kids and in the Torah, that they go to the Bible Islands link. They have free passes and all this kind of stuff. But I'm here for your kids. Amen? Amen. So let's stand and we'll close. Abba, Father, you're our daddy, and you've given us the Shabbat as just as a, as a law of nature. And so, Father, I pray that we would open our hearts, that we would understand that you created this for us, that you sanctified time, and we need to realize that it's not the significance of the things, but it's the significance of the moment and how you want to spend time with us right now this is our prep school so to speak this is the time that we have before we enter eternity and this now is the time that we have to get right with you to do the things that we need to do because the time is coming when it's eternal time and and we can't uh, there's the chain time for change is over this is it so god i pray each one of us would make use of the time that we have in investing in you and spending time with you, and spending time with our family, and realizing what is truly important. Give everyone a safe trip home, and Father, I pray that as people come to the Passover Seder, they would realize that it is a holy time in history that you have set apart because you want to meet with us. We just thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.